me up there. Of course, been wonderful here. And now you're looking at Jerry Jones from Whitney, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and you're wondering, what has that old fool got to say that would help me? Well, I know a lot more about being old than you know about being young. <laughs> So we'll go from there. Uh, I'm uh, an alcoholic. I'm a uh, recovering lawyer. <laughs> I haven't sent any bills or anything like that. I think the committee, the committee brought me here to show you that anyone, even a damn lawyer, can get <laughs> an I'm the adult spouse of an album. <laughs>
there's nothing wrong with the bicycle. Mm -hmm. I said, you've been watching it all morning or afternoon long. You see how it falls over all the time? She said, <laughs> she said yes, I know. But I could ride that. I haven't ridden bicycles in years, she said. But I could ride that bicycle. I said, no. Oh, you could. She said, I will show you. And the next morning, she got up, put on some slacks, went out. I went out and watched it. She uh, started to get on the bicycle. And she fell. <laughs> I really didn't feel sorry for her because I didn't know her. <laughs> She then got on the damn thing and wobbled down the road. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> she was holding on the handlebars and everything, and it went down the road a little ways, and she stopped, laid the bicycle down on the ground, and said, that's all I'm going to do. <laughs> and she went in the house. An hour later, I was riding the bicycle. The message is, what man has done, man can do. And that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. My experience is, I overcame the disease of alcohol, alcoholism. And anyone who's starting this program should know that I'm nothing special. You heard Teresa last night. You hear all kinds of char characters of people who come from every walk of life and every site who have done this thing. But you got to be a player. you got to be in the game to make it work. I didn't know that. I didn't know I had the disease. It's not easy to know when you have alcoholism. Alcohols seem to me like a pretty good thing. I went off to college. That's where I encountered alcohol. I had discovered, you know, I told you I was taught responsibility. I had discovered the solution to responsibility before I got to college. It's called irresponsibility. <laughs> You drive fast, you do all kinds of crazy things, and it kind of loosens you up, and you have a little fun, so you have to go back to work for my father, and then your responsibility kicks back in. Well, I went to college, and I uh, was going to be a basketball player, going to do all kinds of great things. Uh, didn't know exactly what I was going to study. Uh, went there and uh, encountered a thing called a fraternity. Mm -hmm. Fraternity. <laughs> And uh, they were a bunch of World War II veterans who uh, didn't seem to give a damn whether school kept or not. And uh, they drank pretty, pretty well. And I started drinking with them. And right away, right away I discovered this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I had black house within a week at the time I had my first drink. I... Uh, had unusual things happen to me after I drank. For example, I I was found passed out on the band bus in a football game. I did not belong to the band. <laughs> <laughs> and had no real explanation for the dean when she called me in and asked me what I was doing on the band bus. But of course I lied quickly. My friend Frank from Chicago says, Lawyers are innately trained and just know how to lie without thought. Uh, so I told her this wild story about being terribly sick at a football game and walking in the cold trying to find my car and I saw the, the haven of that bus with the door open. I, I was cold and I was sick and I just laid down to rest for a minute. Got a tear or two in my eye. <laughs> She bought it. I didn't get I guess I continue in school, but I party to raise hell and didn't do any good in college at all. Except, except I met my wife. Billy. Billy was a California girl. I saw her the first day she got on the campus. She still had her suitcase with her. And I knew immediately she had certain things that I wanted. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I began to make moves in that direction just as quick as I could, and she uh, she was receptive a little bit at first, and then I don't know. She said she saw me doing some things that 
made it a little cautious in dealing with me that I might not be a good candidate for a lifelong pain. Maybe I drank a little too much. So she would not date me. We became friends, and we had a sort of a symbiotic relationship. I would loan her my car when she needed a car, and she would take notes when she went to class. <laughs> uh, I didn't go to class a lot. Uh, and uh, I didn't, I sold my books, I always sold my books, maybe the day after I bought them. Uh, well, Dad, Dad wanted me to buy books. He understood that. He did not understand partying. And so I'd buy my books on this counter and walk over here and sell them at this one to get some cash. And I was fixed for a few days, you know. And uh, so, but it's hard to pass tests when you don't go to class and you don't have a book. Uh, but she would loan me her notes, and she took good notes. And so I, I uh, unexpectedly, I graduated from college. And I uh, went off to uh, Officer's Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, and managed to get through there in some way. And I came back through college town. She was a year behind me. And I was wearing my uniform. And I looked pretty damn good. <laughs> I was an officer and a gentleman in the United States Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was impressed. She thought I had matured. <laughs> That's what she says anyway. <laughs> My wife is a wonderful woman. She's good looking. She was a sun princess. Yes, the El Paso Sun Bowl. While I was in school there, she was a college beauty. And I really did hanker for her. Uh, that's a farm expression. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, she started writing me letters, and I answered them, and I went overseas on the ship for a while, and came back to Los Angeles, the Long Beach area, and she uh, had come back home to California, and we met again, and we had a Rather story, quick courtship, and we're married. Uh, she thought, she says, that my, my dad told her one time that he quit drinking when he got married. And she just assumed, she says she thought I told her that that's what I was going to do. It never crossed my mind. <laughs> I liked to drink. God, I just loved it. I mean, I can get excited about getting drunk a week from tonight. <laughs> Man, we're going to pool our money, buy some booze, put some gasoline in somebody's car, and we're going to take off and there ain't no damn telling where we'll be tomorrow night. And that was a great mystery, kind of fun. Generally, the first question we asked when we woke up was, where are we? <laughs> Followed closely by what did we do? And nobody had the answer. We had to piece together the information until finally we got some ideas and then all the other guys, I kept about three groups working all the time. Uh, I was always the guy that found a little bit of booze somewhere and drank it and said, let's do it again. And some of them wouldn't go with me every day, and so I had to have different groups that I moved through. But I just wanted I, like it. I didn't mind the hangovers, I didn't mind the trouble I got into, I just liked, liked the way it made me feel. And uh, I uh, was never going to give that up. And so when my wife told me that that's what she thought I was going to do, I carefully explained to her that that was not in the cards. <clears throat> so I didn't drink much, didn't have any money. That's, that slows down your drinking when you don't have any money. Uh, so I stayed in the Navy, got out of the Navy, and went to law school. Uh, I don't actually know why I went to law school, except I couldn't find a job. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that I liked it. I fit perfectly in the law school. I don't I just loved it. I never thought about quitting. I, was old. I had a wife and kid by that time. My son was born, and I uh, went to the University of Texas Law School and, and did well. Got a good job when I got out of there. Didn't drink much in law school. Found out you really didn't, couldn't drink and take those tests and do very good in law school. So I, I just didn't do it for a while. 
I drank in between semesters, stayed in the Navy Reserve for a while, and I could go off and have little vacations where I could drink what I wanted to drink. <laughs> then I got into law practice, and right away I had to make a decision about what I was going to be, what kind of lawyer. I have another characteristic, and that is if there's competition going on, I need to do it. I need to get involved. Because if I don't, I'm afraid that you'll think I'm afraid to compete. And I'm not afraid to compete. I'm scared to death doing it, but I'm not going to do it. If we're throwing quarters in the sidewalk, I'm going to get in the game. You can watch that happen. And uh, so I became a trial lawyer. And trial lawyers drink well. We're kind of wild and woolly and full of fleas, you know. Never been carried below the knees. That's what didn't bother me at all when I was a heavy drinker. Bothered my wife. We began to have discussions about alcohol. Lots of discussions about alcohol. <laughs> we talked about money. We had a lot of discussions about money. Her use of money and how much she spent. And her answer was always the same. I only bought what we needed. Well, that's fine. Except it's hard to keep up with what we needed when you're drinking and doing the kind of stuff I was. Anyway, we had a lot of arguments and discussions about this thing. And so I recognized my wife was, she was super sensitive about this thing called alcohol. Uh, overly sensitive. So I sent her to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Two weeks ago, she was back on the case, you know, 
drink? How much I drink? How much I drink? The minute I walked in the door in the evening, she wanted to eat. We sat down and have dinner. And the hell I had to drink for a while before I could eat. And we had fights about that. And it just went on that way. And then she did something after a year or two or three. She did something that was just inexcusable. She, uh, she didn't ask me about this. She didn't tell me what she was going to do. And without any real good reason, she went to Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I had just made senior partner in the largest law firm in Dallas. I was successful by most people's standards. I stayed home all the time because I couldn't afford to get caught out drunk. Mm -hmm. So I just drank at home. And I thought I was doing a really good job. And uh, one night I uh, wanted my wife for some reason and she wasn't there. And that's a bad, bad mark against her. Which is, when I want her, I want her there now. <laughs> She, uh, I said, where's your mother? That's my daughter. And she said, I don't know, Daddy. I said, where do you think she is? Well, she said, I don't know. She may have gone to one of those meetings. I said, what kind of meeting are we talking about? She said, I don't know anything about that. It's a family meeting. At that point in time, I had told my wife that she didn't straighten up. <laughs> in about six months, we just get a divorce because I knew she didn't want one. And uh, it occurred to me that if my wife was going to family meetings under those circumstances and hadn't told me about it or asked permission to go, uh, that probably I ought to have a representative present at those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and the lawyer I knew, they could literally take all your damn money away from you and all these divorce things they talk about. So when she came in, I confronted her. Now my wife is the most difficult witness I ever cross examined. <laughs> she will not lie. But when she decides she doesn't want to give me information, it's just like it's like trying to hit a snake with an ice pick. It's just really <laughs> I said, where have you been? And she said, out. <laughs> answer told me what the rest of the evening was going to be like. <laughs> Out where? To a shopping center. Which one? Preston Center. What did you do there? Met some friends. Who were they? You wouldn't know. <laughs> what did you and your unknown friends do? She said, to share our experience, strength, and hope. <laughs> what is your experience, strength, and hope? <laughs> We go on from there, and finally I get this word. This word comes out of her that I've never heard in my life. Al-Anon. Al-Anon. What would be an Al-Anon? <laughs> We're pretty deeply in, involved in this argument by now. Tempers are a little higher, and I did not want to appear ignorant. So I made my best guess. I thought it might be an aluminum kitchen utensil. <laughs> it isn't. And when you ask an Alanon what it is, you open the floodgate for all kinds of information that you do not wish to receive. <laughs> It's so good if people knew how good it was they pay $500 for a seat in a meeting. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is helpful. Everyone shares. It's just a marvelous organization. And the only requirement for membership is that you have a friend or family member who has a problem with alcohol. Bing! <laughs> I've just become the bargaining chip in a poker game that I did not want to play. <laughs> I said, Billy, we need to talk about this now. I sat her down in the chair, gazed deeply into her eyes, and said, do you understand? 
that I am the only one who brings any money home to this family. Yes. Do you know that we need money? Yes. Do you know we owe down there everybody in town? We have furniture, we have house payments, we have car payments, we have all kinds of payments. Do you realize if the money stops, what happens? What happens? Those people who do not get paid come and get the thing that we bought, like the house, the car, the furniture, they take it away. We are considering a situation here which doesn't involve our children's college education. We're about to wind up naked on the streets of Dallas in the middle of the winter with our children. <laughs> because you're going to a meeting where you're calling me an alcoholic. If those lawyers downtown in my office find out you think I'm an alcoholic, they will fire me that day. The money will stop and we're on the street. You must not, must not go to any more of those meetings. <laughs> and she looked at me with those blue eyes and said, I think I need to go. I said, Billy, Billy please do not go to any of those meetings. And she said, Jerry, I believe I'm going to go. And then I said something loving like, you know, well, if you go to another one and I find out about it, I'll kill you, you sure as hell. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I'm going, and she did. And she got a sponsor. Oh, my God. <laughs> the most heartless woman I guess I've ever seen. I didn't even know her. She knew whatever button I had to bring, whatever string to pull, you know. God, it was terrible. <laughs> she told my wife to wake up every morning. The moment she awakened to say, this is the day the Lord has made, I shall rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> now, when you had a quart of whiskey the night before, <laughs> you got that stuff all over your tongue and your eyes. One eye's been popped open for about three hours. You got a case of a dry socket. When you hear that, you're reasonably sure you're not going to do any rejoicing that day. She did that. And I began, a, a, I had a mission to try to get her out of Alabama. I worked on it every day. Every day I went to work sweating the fact that there's somebody in that office going to call me in and say, we understand your wife thinks you're an alcoholic. And we've already got two. <laughs> That's a full compliment for this law firm. In fact, we're going to get rid of those two just as quick as we can. And I wouldn't have lasted any time at all. But they didn't do that. I didn't hear from them. I'd go home relieved and think I've got to get that woman out of Alabama. And I'd start trying another way. I begged. I threatened, I bargained, I did everything you could think of. I'm not real proud of this, but sometimes I intentionally pick fights with my wife. I know, going home, we're going to have a fight tonight. I'm going to think what I need to get her to admit before she knows we're in a fight. That's a good tactic here at Richard. <laughs> So I went in the house and I said, Billy, hmm, dinner smells good. She said, well, thank you. I said, how, how's the, how was your day? It was good. How the kids? Kids, do all right at school? Yeah, yeah, kids are fine. Dog, how's the dog? Is dog okay? Yeah, dog. <laughs> I said, Billy, really, I've been thinking, do you think I'm an alcoholic? And she said, I don't know whether you are or not. I said, well, that's damn funny. You've been calling me an alcoholic for years. And she said, yes, but I was wrong. It's really very hard to get a fight started when they're acting like this. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I don't know what you are or not. I thought I did, but I don't know. It doesn't make any difference what I think. It didn't make any difference what your parents think, what your partners think, what the children think, what anybody in the world thinks except you. It only matters what you think. Because if you don't, 
think you have a problem with alcohol, you will never do anything about it. And I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> no good trial lawyer should ever ask a question in a situation like this one unless you know the answer. And I said, well, if I wanted to find out if I was an alcoholic, how would I do it? <laughs> <laughs> and the jaws of the Allen on track closed. <laughs>
On December 31st of 1972, I had only one objective. I needed to go out to dinner with some friends for, on New Year's Eve, have dinner and come back to my house where we were going to bring the New Year in. And I needed to be sober enough to do that. I didn't have to be sober, but sober enough not to cause a problem. I know why we're going out to have eat dinner, and I know why we're coming back to my house because already this month I've been, I got out one time and I couldn't get back for a while. And uh, it caused a couple problems that I didn't want to talk about. <laughs> I don't care a lot about talking about them, but I, I, I got back. Anyway, I, uh, I uh, started that day, and it was a festive day. There's a football game. I decided to log in. 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning, maybe nice to have a little time. So I fixed myself a drink, and my wife walks through the room, and she says, remember, and I said, I got it. I got it. I know we're going out tonight. I'm going to be all right. Just, I got it. She said, fine. She went off, minding her business. And then through the day, I kind of paced myself. And then I woke up in my green chair. And I looked out the window and it was pitch black. And I looked over and my wife sat there in a little chair with a little book. They read little books a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and they leave them around the house if you want to read them yourself. <laughs> She said something loving and Alan like, you got it. And 
to what's reality in this world. I had been off in the materialistic world. I'd been fighting for money. I'd been fighting for promotion, status, prestige, all the things that we do in this world. Looking for happiness. I always thought I knew what would make me happy. And it was always something I didn't have at the moment, but it was just maybe I could get it. And I would get it, and I would think for 10 minutes that I, that's it. I'm going to be really happy now, only I wouldn't be. And I think, well, if it's not this, it must be something a little more of this, a little different kind, or a little better quality. And I kept chasing more, better, and different. And I've been doing that for a long time until I got way out of the weeds all the way off from those things that my family had taught me. Uh, all the way out where I lived in a world that I didn't even realize I was living in. I led a knee-jerk re a reaction to life. You push this button, you get this kind of guy. You push that button, you get another kind of guy. And it was all materialistic and there was no spirituality into it at all. I. Uh, I started in Alcoholics Anonymous, I did not like them. I never met a group of people like this. <laughs> this is a strange bunch. <laughs> Jeez. At the drop of the hat, they'll tell you some terrible damn thing they did while they were drunk or good. And everybody laughed like hell. <laughs> Most inappropriate sense of humor I'd ever heard of. <laughs> And they said that the guy standing up for him said, My name's Jerry. And everybody said, Hi, Jerry. <laughs> it's like a high school fraternity. My God, I'm slipping with this. <laughs> and they hugged. Oh, my God, the hugs. They just, men and women both, just drag you and hug you. The drop of ass, trying to give you coffee at every opportunity. <laughs> uh, I got in and out of that place as long, quick as I could, uh, waiting for somebody to come around and show me the way. There's a secret here somewhere, but I can't find the damn thing. It's certainly not through little plaques on the wall. The steps. The hell the steps. I'm having trouble not getting a drink today. And they, uh, they kept after me. And I kept watching them. I'm critically... I really watch things, and I listen, and I began to hear those people, and they were different kind of folks. Ain't nobody asked me what my profession was, in, for example. I'm sure I told them, but I didn't ask them. <laughs> and I, uh, they didn't ask me whether I had a, what kind of house I lived in, whether I had a swimming pool, what kind of car I drove, how much money. They weren't interested in any of that stuff. They talked about my feelings, and they'd say, how are you feeling? Well, hell, I'll tell you how I'm feeling. I'm shaky, uh, but I don't hurt any work, so I guess I'm fine. And they'd say, what step are you working on? Well, hell, I don't know what step I'm working on. I'm not drinking. And uh, it, was, it was kind of confusing to me, but I began to recognize these were people were in a, living, in a different world than I was living in. They were caring, concerned, loving, and they were not honestly interested in trying to help me. And they talked about themselves in the effort to show me what they had done, what man has done, man can do. You can do this. You can do this no matter what your profession is, what you what you do during the day, you can you can stay sober and you can do this thing. But you have to do certain things. And I told them finally, I said, look, I've been to a lot of churches. God's all over this place. God's God spread all the wall and people were talking about higher powers and God. I said, I don't have faith. And the ministers have always told me, you, if you want to believe, you've got to have faith. And I've decided I would have faith. I've sat down in the chair and said, I'm going to have faith. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have faith. I don't know how I'm going to get this thing. And they told me, they said, we don't give a damn whether you have faith or not. All we want you to do is what the book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells you to do. To take the action described in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Do the things it tells you to do. And by the time you finish taking the steps, 
you will experience a new world and you will have a spiritual awakening. Well, by then I began to think, maybe I'll like these people. Maybe I'll do that. My wife got me lined up to go to a retreat out in East Texas for families. There were 10 couples that went out there to this Baptist minister. I'm a Methodist, if I was anything. I'll just show you the depth of my commitment. I went to a Baptist field. <laughs> I had not been dunked. They were bad about dunking you, and I was a sprinkler. <laughs> Anyway, we went out there and we had dinner and we sat down on the floor of a little room. We didn't have chairs, just sitting there. And this guy stood out in the middle, a young, man, young minister. And he said, okay, let's get this thing started right. Let's find out what, I want to go around the circle here. Well, everybody tell me what God is doing for you in your life today. And I thought, this is testimonial time. They're going to ask me to give testimony here. I'm not going to do that. Methodists don't do that. Baptists do, but Methodists don't do that. <laughs> and I would have left the room, except I was going to have to get up off the floor and crawl out the door or whatever. <laughs> and my wife was going to stay right there where she was. She was young and I knew this. So I thought, well, surely somebody would pass. Somebody will say, excuse me, thank you, no, whatever. So I waited. But the civilians, they were all civilians. And it went around the room and they had the piddliest little damn problems you ever heard of. Why don't you drive Central Expressway in Dallas without God? Well, hell, I've driven Central Expressway and drunk her good around for years. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't raise a family without God. I did all right without my family by God. Don't talk to me about families. Marriage, you know, all this stuff's going on. I got thinking, well, you know, these people, these people don't know they've got a real alcoholic sitting in this room who has stayed sober for what, 30 days, 60 days, maybe 90 days now. If I would repress the hell out of these people if I told them, God, maybe God is helping me doing this. I could tell them that. Actually, they probably want to counsel with me after me. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided what I'll tell them. I didn't hear anything for a while because I'm rehearsing my speech. <laughs> I'm sure none of you ever done that, but I heard that. <laughs> Finally, an old boy got up and he got my attention. He was just two people down there. A pretty little, pretty little girl sat next to me, uh, which I figured was his wife. And he got up and he was a big old boy. West Texas, wearing gray eyes and jeans and had calluses on the back of his hands where they drug the ground, you know. <laughs> and he started trying to talk and he was bawling. He'd blow his nose and he'd bubble and gurgle and I didn't understand what in the hell he was saying. I was embarrassed for his wife to have a husband who was acting like that. I just wanted to try God to sit down. Sit down. Finally, he she got up and she said, I couldn't do it without God. She was pretty, slender, had gray eyes like my mother. She said, I couldn't do it without God. He sustains me every day. He is the strength in my life. And the greatest thing about him is that he's available to everyone. And everyone will have an opportunity to find him. And life is designed to help us find this God. And my children, who are only two and three years old, are too young to have found him yet. But someone will be here to help them find God, even though I won't be. She began to talk about it. She said, my husband, you see how he's reacting to this situation. It's going to be really hard, but he'll find someone else in his life to help him raise these kids and to help him live his life. I realize this woman's talking about cancer. She's going to die. She's going to die soon. And here she is talking this way. And I identified with her because by then I accepted the idea that I had 
a disease, an incurable disease called alcoholism. <clears throat> and that I, I had to, I had a solution for mine. And if the doctor had told her, you can have Jerry's solution, Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll have to take both of your legs. He'd say, I'll take it, just like that. I didn't make talk. I had a great thought. I've been feeling sorry for myself for giving up drinking, for the kind of life I thought I wanted, for the kind of life I thought would make me happy and never had. <clears throat> the great thought was, ain't you got a tough cowboy? Ain't you got a tough, all you got to do is go to those meetings, live the kind of life that's described in the program about all Anonymous, and you can go anywhere and do anything in this world that God ever intended for you to do. Like I said, I didn't make a talk. I don't even have any idea how I got out of that room. I was out in the woods, walking around, <coughs> calling and making an old boy with the cows on the back of his hands. I'm making him feel like a hero because I was crying worse than he was. And I wasn't crying because I was sad. I'm crying because I'm grateful. I went from a moment of self-pity to a moment of gratitude just like that. Mm. And that will knock you on your knees. And it has it sustained me for a long time. I began to think about this thing called God again. When I was in law school, I had a professor. He's a nationally known expert on evidence. And he uh, he was te teaching us one day, and he said there's two basic kinds of evidence. There's direct evidence, and there's circumstantial evidence. And he said, direct evidence, let me give you an example. He said, there's a, take a case where there's an old farmer who supplies milk to a community. And the community decides that he is watering his milk. He puts water in it so he can sell more of it. And, and they're trying a lawsuit for doing that. And he said, now direct evidence would be if you saw Farmer Brown pouring water into his milk bucket. That's direct evidence that he's watering the milk. But if you took a bowl, a glass bowl, and poured a, a quart of his milk or a bottle of his milk into the bowl, and there's a minnow swimming around in there, you will establish by circumstantial evidence that this man is watering milk because minnows don't grow up in milk. He said, the circumstantial evidence is just as strong and sometimes stronger than direct evidence. I began to recognize that I was never going to see the kind of direct evidence I wanted of God. I was never going to see God. I gave up on that idea. I was never going to have any kind of the miracles, probably, that, that I had been hoping for, burning bushes and all this kind of stuff. But I began to look for minutes. That night, out there in Van, Texas, I saw a man. I saw something happen to me that couldn't have happened any other time. I began to hear things and see things in life around me that I had no explanation for. I had strength that I didn't know I had. My mother, God, I love her. She was a great gal. She got cancer. She got cancer before I got sober. <laughs> She called me and asked me if I'd come up to uh, for a surgery she was going to have. I went up to take do the surgery. I didn't take a bottle because she never did like drinking. So I wasn't going to drink. They started the surgery and it hadn't been going on any time. And the old family doctor who was observing the surgery came out and said to my dad and I, said, boys, it ain't no good. That cancer's everywhere. <clears throat> She'll be dead in a year. And it's like somebody flipped a switch somewhere. I turned around and walked out of that hospital and went to a liquor store and bought a bottle, bought a bottle. And I, for two or three days, I stayed around. And she went to recovery and she got, they sold her up and she was, she, got, she came out. But everybody knew I was drunk. Everybody knew I was drunk and I was of no value to anybody and they sent me home. When I was five years sober, she called me. Many years had passed between these two times. And she uh, she said, Jerry, they thought they had me cured, but they found another lump in my stomach. They're going to operate. Would you come 
come up and be with me. I said, you bet. So I, I went there. And she, we, she and I had a talk. And it was a, a good talk. There was no pressure. It was just easy. A loving talk between a mother and son. And she said, Jerry, I want you to get the family in here. I need to talk to them. So I rounded up all of them. My dad and all the people that were around. And she said, folks, I don't know whether you know it or not, this can be really hard on me. I don't know whether I'll make it this time or not. She said, I'm going to try. But I'm a lot weaker and a lot sicker than I've ever been before in my life. And it's going to be hard on you too. This is not going to be easy on any of us. But while this is going on, lean on Jared. He'll be your strength. And it was. I was. I went through that deal. I watched my mother die over a two or three week period in, in terrible, terrible pain. It was just not a good thing. My dad blew a great big ulcer while I was happy and I had to take out most of his stomach. He didn't get to go to the funeral. And I had to arrange all the funeral and deal with everything that was going on. And it was a week or two after that, her death was all over. But I suddenly realized that, you know, not one second not one second did I ever think about taking a drink. <coughs> it never even occurred to me. Something had been added to my life which allowed me to have one of the biggest tra tragedies I've ever encountered in a way that I could be useful and helpful and caring to those around me. And it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <coughs> I've had a lot of those kinds of experiences. I've seen many, many minnows in my life. And I see many in yours. We are blessed with the ability to experience life, see life, and live life in such a way that we understand and know that there is a power at work in the human. Not the power that the preachers sometimes talk about, maybe if that doesn't fit your head, it didn't fit mine. But there is a power that functions in this universe and it's, you know, just the principles of alcoholics and honest. Who made those principles? Where did honesty come from? Is that a God gift? Is truth, honesty, and kindness, and love? Did man just make those up? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there is there are proof, there are minnows that show us that there is a power existing in this universe which if we're living right and tuning into it will allow us to live this life no matter what comes down the pike with a reasonable degree of happiness, joy, and usefulness to be of service to our fellow man. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. It lays out the practice. You come here and I can talk when I'm blue in the face and I'll not fix one drunk. I will not fix one drunk. I may encourage you to try to go back to those steps into your group where you can work one-on-one -on -one with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous and your life will change. And that's what I really hope that I can do. But I myself can't do anything. I, uh, I hate cancer. I've just had two kinds. I have leukemia right now. I've had prostate cancer. And it's kind of ironic because I took my mother and, you know, I, I really didn't like it much. Uh, I gave a lot of time to the cancer deal. And I was sitting on the side of my bed one day after I got leukemia and I was waiting to die. Is today the day going to be? What's going to happen today? What's it going to be like? What, can I handle it? And then I looked out there, it was a pretty day, and a thought came to me. You know, it's a nice day. I'm not going to screw this day up, worrying about what's going to happen in the future. I'm not going to do that. You can, you know, I had an attitude for a long time in my life. One of the things that I read, heard recently that I would have bought into at that time was if you're in perfect health today, you're one day nearer your death. 
wrong side of the coin. Wrong side of the coin. Enjoy today, live today, give today. That's all there is. It's all there is. And you are the bike riders of the world as far as alcoholism is concerned and addiction. You're the, you're the answer in your community, in your group, if you will do the work and get reap the benefit. Lois Wilson was the last of our founders to die. And she was in her final days of life and everybody knew she was about to pass away and she was in intensive care in New York. And the director of um, AA went to General Service Office, went to see her and thank her for what she had done for Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, she couldn't talk. She had tubes and things in her throat. But she had a little pan. He talked to her for a while and he said, oh, I came here today with, so I could tell you that, to thank you for what you've done for Alcoholics Anonymous. And she wrote her a little pad. Not me, God. And he said, oh, oh you got me, Lois. Of course that's right. I know that. Of course that's right. But he said, Lois, you were his messenger. And she wrote again. And so were you. And so are each of you. We are the messengers. We are the hands of this power that can save so many people from the world of addiction. There are 13 million alcoholics in the United States by some kind of estimate. Two million are in alcoholics anonymous. There's a great field, hunting field out there. It's not hard. <laughs> Hunt drunks. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I was very worried about my anonymity. I figured that law firm would fire me. And after about a year, they hadn't said a damn word. I'd been going to AA for a year, and I figured they'd fire me for going to AA. Finally, I decided I'm, I'm, they're, going to fire, they're going to fire me at the annual party. And, like <laughs> and I'm fairly aggressive, and I said, damn, if they are. I forced the issue. So I picked out five of them and I went to see them. I went to see the meanest one first. He was the manager of the firm. And I went in to try to see him and he was, he was rough. He was not a warm and cuddly person. Knocked on his door and said, Yes, yeah, what can I do for you? And I said, Well, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. What is it? I'm pretty busy. Uh, yes, sir. No, I won't take much of your time. Come on in. Said, what is it? What is it? And I said, Well, sir, I won't tell you something. I'm an alcoholic, and I've been going to Alcoholics Anonymous for 11 months. And I'm not telling you this because I have no reason. I'm going to tell you this because if you see me drunk somewhere, you know some of our clients are in trouble. And if you know anybody that's got my problem, I think I know a way to help them. And I knew he would react. I expect him to see your fire. But he said, I am delighted. My God, we wondered what was wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> and for a half hour, he sat there, this man who would never praise anybody, the fact that I knew and told him what a valuable asset I was to that offer. <laughs> and how they, he said, you notice I've started sending you business again. I said, yeah, well, I have. I have noticed things are picking up a little bit. And he said, well, you'll get more. We need you. We need you. And you're doing a good thing. That alcohol is anonymous. He said, that thing is fantastic. He said, I don't know nearly as much about that as I'd like to. But it's a great, great thing. Stay with it. And I walked out of his office, and I knew no fear. I went and told those other four guys, I didn't give a damn whether they liked it or didn't like it. The boss was on my side, and we're going down the road again. <laughs> Go down the road. Go down the road. Rise your bikes. And I want to thank you for having me here. I appreciate it very much. Oh.